This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Huskers Radio Network Analyst, Jeremiah Searles. And we are back. Same duo, new name this year, mm. because we are now sponsored by Valentino's Pizza. Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cooty. How excited are you to I be sponsored wait. by Val's? Oh, I love it. I love Valentino's Pizza. It's <laughs> phenomenal. We had some victory Val's there afterwards, the games last year. Me and Greg and Ben went up there and debrief from the games and we'd be able to eat some pizza and just kind of relax loved it loved and it's it. not monday pressers without no Val's either. no 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 especially the dessert pizza the oh Val's yeah dessert pizza it's is the best fire the yeah. cheese one the apple one's a close second but the cheesecake one the like strawberry cheesecake one or whatever that is so freaking good so that's why it is now the sideline slice with Searles as opposed to the sideline scoop but we're back we're gonna be a uh, Visiting with you guys every single week. The best Husker breakdown you can find is right here with Jeremiah Soros. How you been? I've been good. I've been crazy busy. You know, I have been, the agency has really taken off. Um, for those people that don't know, I'm an NFL agent. So, you know, that's really taken off for me. We had our first class last year, which was super fun. We ended up putting four guys in the NFL as a group. Um, and so this year we're going to go even bigger. You know, the train has left the station and it's full steam ahead. And that note, you know, I am this year going to have to take a little bit more of a step back here on the network, which makes me really sad. Um, but I'm not going to be able to do the sideline this year, you know, talking with my wife and talking with the people here in Nebraska. You know, it's just it's time for me to take a little break with something building brand new. You know, the agency last year was really new, but this is really the year that I need to go all in and really push this and grow this thing. As anyone who started a new business knows, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So I will be taking a step back off of the sideline this year. Um, I'll still be around, still doing the podcast, still be doing radio hits. I just will not be as involved on game day. But I am very excited to be able to hand that torch to you now as you take over the sideline duties and you can interview Coach Frost at halftime. <laughs> well, I, I am so excited. Everybody's laughing. I'm, I'm really excited um, and excited for the role, but I'm sad that you won't be there on game days. But we're not going to uh, deprive uh, Husker fans from hearing your analysis because we're going to Keep this podcast going. You'll you'll be around. You'll be a part, but it won't be the same on game days without you. But someone else is gonna have to bring the energy because I would bring <laughs> I the know. energy each and every single week. And I don't know if that's you. I don't know if it's Greg. I don't know if it's old Dowdy back there. <laughs> but someone's gonna have to bring the energy here on game day because I'm not gonna be able to pick up the slack for you guys this year. I know all the clips that you find from all the digital crew of you pumping up on the sideline, like animated. And you don't even know the camera's on you, but you are so hyped down there. Yeah, I'll try my best. I'll try my best to fill those shoes, but you'll be around. You'll be a part. So we're excited to still have you here with the podcast. Um, again, I, nobody does it better than you, in my opinion, at, at breaking down and previewing things and studying and all of that. So we wanted to keep bringing that to Husker fans. So we're thankful for Valentino's to continue to make this happen. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm still really excited. You know, this is a young team in a weird way. It's like young and old, but you know, I'm so excited to take a peek at what the 2022 Huskers are gonna be because so many new faces, old faces that have been around for what seemed like ever are now gone. Like Ben Stilley College Forever is finally off with the <laughs> Miami Dolphins doing this thing. Adrian's now gone, you know. There's a lot of different moving pieces that I'm really excited to dive into that first game against Northwestern and really kind of follow everything through camp and really just kind of see what this team's makeup's gonna be. How has it felt, at, you know, buzz wise because it does it seems like there's a lot of buzz a lot of excitement around the team with the new pieces the new coaches i mean from recruiting and the big commitments that are rolling in to just the excitement level of this team what's it been like evaluating the buzz of this team in this program you know it's different and the reason i say that there was a ton of buzz when coach frost came in right like right in the ship here we go everything's gonna go right back to where we needed it to where obviously that didn't happen as quickly as we wanted it to now it's almost like this uncertainty buzz where you got one camp that's like, look at all the great things that's happening. We're gonna take this thing off. It's gonna be awesome. And then you have the other camp that's like, you know, I've been fooled one too many times over the last few years. Like, I'm just gonna hold back my my reservations right now. I do think as we get closer to September, the Kool Aid starts to get a little bit more. Let's drink it and have one in, and that's a good thing because I do think there's a lot of good excitement around this football team based off of some of the pieces that we've added. But the buzz is a little weird to me this time of year just because I think there's so much uncertainty from the coaching staff to the quarterback position to the offensive line position, D-line. I mean, every every room has a question mark in it besides maybe the inside linebackers between Luke Reimer and 
Henrik, right? Those are the only two that are like, okay, yeah, those two guys. Other than that, huge question marks everywhere, but that can be a good thing. Change isn't always a bad thing. I have to remind myself of that because I hate change. But change isn't always a bad thing, too, for football teams. Well, so last year, after last year's team, a lot of leaders exited that were on uh, the defense, captains, and even Austin Allen for the offense, Adrian Martinez. A lot of those leaders are now gone, and so you're, you're seeing an emergence of new leadership for this program. And I did a podcast the other day with Dave Ellis and Zach Duvall, a uh, strength and conditioning coach, and they mentioned the Unity Council, and it got brought up multiple times and how good of a job that group has done leading this team this year. And, and that's when the best teams are when it's player led, right? When, when you have the most success on the field is when it comes from the players. So I kind of wanted to get your perspective on that. And first of all, just break down a unity council for those that might not be familiar of what goes into a unity council. Yeah, so I won't speak for the people that are here because it might be a little different than when I played. But you know, the unity council is a group of players, not necessarily all seniors, but a group of players that is voted on by the team members and the coaches that are essentially the captains of the off season all the way through the season, right? Kind of those that year, the captain of that year. And when I was here is made up of like five or six guys. And basically they were kind of the voice from the locker room to the coaches. And they were also kind of the voice from the coaches down into the locker room, right? You, you nailed it. Player led teams are the best teams. Players that police each other and hold each other accountable are usually the most disciplined teams as well. Because there's something about when your coach is coming down on you or another position coach is coming down on you and you're just like, man, like again, here it goes, but it's something when it's coming from your brother who stands to the left of you or is taking the snap or whoever it is and they look you in the eyes and call you out, it carries a different kind of weight. It just does. And so the fact that you're hearing that the Unity Council is doing a great job, that means that the players are holding everyone to a very high standard. Because you can't be on the Unity Council if you're a slappy. You just can't. <laughs> no one's going to listen to you. No one's gonna, If you're up there and you're doing your thing and you're not showing up or you're late or you're just slacking in lifts or whatever, no one's going to listen to you. you. When you get put on the Unity Council, you are held to a higher standard. And that's just the way it is. That's what le good leaders do. And that at times means that you're not everyone's friend. And that's a hard thing to do in college football. NFL is mm -hmm. a little different because you're getting paid a lot of money. College football, it's a hard thing to not be liked by all your teammates because you're with them all the time. And so that's, it's a great position to be put on. It's a hard position, but the fact that they're doing so well and we keep hearing their name brought up, it means that things are going right inside the walls of Memorial Stadium. Were you a part of a team that was not as player-led as well as opposed to um, teams that were player led that had more success. I mean, you can feel the difference between the two, right? Yeah, you know, I think that my whole time in Nebraska, I think we were really well player led. Mm -hmm. You know, we were able to groom the younger players into being those leaders. I mean, I think back to guys like Keith Williams, who's now on staff here. He was a senior when I was here. Guys like Mike Smith, Zach Lee, um, Nate Swift, like those guys taught the young guys what it meant to be a leader. And that's when it trickles down like that, it becomes an organic thing of getting into leadership, not something that's forced. You know, every time everyone thinks that the best player should necessarily be the leader, that's not necessarily true. The right player needs to be the leader. And obviously some of those positions are naturally leaders, quarterbacks, DNs, like the high names. But you mean, you might have a, a rotational defensive lineman, a guy like Damian Jackson, who's no longer with the team, but a guy like him was a rotational guy, but commanded a lot of respect because he did things the right way. Those are the kind of guys that you want on that council. And those are the kind of guys that push the team in the right direction. Perfect that you mentioned that, you know, you instill it and you pass it down to the younger guys because now it's Garrett Nelson's time. And he is a name that we've heard. I've heard from players, new players, transfer players, players that are younger coming in, freshmen. I've heard it from coaches. I've heard it from the staff, uh, from Zach Duvall, from Dave Ellis, from everybody keeps bringing up his name and how he's stepping into that role for this team. That doesn't surprise you, right? That it's him that it's um, that's emerging? Not in the slightest. I mean, I, I saw the natural leadership ability on that guy when he was a freshman and I was still working out in the NFL. I mean, we <laughs> used to call him psycho because he'd walk around all juiced up. He had the mullet back then. And you could just see that that dude embodied Husker football. Right, I mean, he just loves it. Now, do I think he walks around like he's the star of his own movie sometimes? Yeah, but that's okay. You know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it makes the sometimes best football Sometimes that's the swagger, right? There's, there's a swagger piece that comes to that. Now, when you can back that up on the field is when that comes a special person. When you got the guy that walks around that thinks he's, oh, all that, and then on the field he's a dud, then it's like, okay, well, but Gary Nelson backs it up on the field. I mean, that dude plays lights out effort. He's extremely talented. He needs to take a big step in his pass rushing ability this year, and you've heard him mention that a lot, so he's a self-aware player, which I love. 
you know, I think that he's a guy that you're going to really lean on because, like you said, you lose Ben Stilley. You lose your entire defensive Joe line. Joe. Let's call it, you, you lose your entire defensive line yes, besides yeah. him and Caleb Tanner. I mean, let's just call it the way it is. And then you lose JoJo and Cam Taylor and all these names that have been around forever, like we talked about at the beginning. Those are someone's got to step up. And it's so natural for him, a homegrown kid, bought, grew up watching the Huskers, plays with his hair on fire. No coach, every coach in America would love to have 11 Garrett Nelsons on the <laughs> field at all times. So not surprised that he's going to be a big leader and he's going to play a huge role in this season. Can you take us through the process of how you go about voting on a team captain for this program? It's a special thing, and sometimes it's announced, you know, it's never a certain time mm -hmm. specifically, but how you go about those captains developing and when you know that that's a captain and that's going to be your guy that you vote for. You know, we did a little differently when Bo was here. Uh, we rotated captains weekly. And then at the end of the year, we voted on captains because you really do see throughout the year who becomes a captain. Now, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people do it differently. I mean, the NFL obviously names everyone before the season. I think a lot of teams like to name guys before the season to put them in that uncomfortable leadership role if there needs something that needs to happen from uh, coach to player to locker room. Um, you know, but I think a lot of it comes through how they work in the off season, how they lead in the off season, and how they do all those things. And then the team rallies around those guys. They vote, and then they get to decide who gets to be the captain. Um, I think coaches do get a little bit of say in it, but I mean, the best captains are the ones that are voted on by their teammates. And another guy too that name keeps coming up, Travis Bokalek, which mm -hmm. is important for him to fill that role of your client. Austin Allen yeah. was a big leader for this team. And I think Travis is ready for that role. And he's, that was a goal when I talked to him in December, he wanted to be a captain. He wanted to be a leader and, and step into that role for this team. Yeah, I mean, you look at the success that Austin Allen had last year, especially on the back half of the year, you can see that the use of the tight end in that offense is was prevalent. I think they're gonna look at that and be like, okay, we need to use Travis basically just pull Austin out, input Travis Volkolek. They're very similar players and their athletic ability and the way that they do things. And Whipple likes to use the tight end. Whipple loves to use his tight ends. And I, that's great for Austin, or excuse me, that's great for Travis because he wants to go play in the NFL. They're going to use him a lot. And he's a guy that coming off the injury last year, didn't play a full season, rotated in. We run a lot of 11 personnel, which is one tight end. So Austin was the 11, which was known as the Y, and he was kind of the F. So this year, it's, it's his opportunity to really take over as the Y, the guy that really never comes off the field, right? If you're 11, you're in 12, you're in 13, you always have a tight end on the field. He's never gonna come off the field, which is great for him. And so him to be able to go out there and perform and also, I mean, he's at media days. So, I mean, you can tell the team really loves what he does for this program. And he's a great kid. I love that kid. I'm super excited for him this year. I'm going golfing with him um, on Wednesday. We're going to do a feature for Coach Frost's TV show. He can TV show. pound really? the golf ball. Well, pound it. I, I've heard that he's uh, pretty pretty salty on the golf course. Long so. levers and strong. Yeah, <laughs> and he can rotate. My problem is I can't rotate. I've been a linear athlete my whole life. Like, I was taught never rotate. And so I look like a fridge swinging a club out there. But I've golfed with Travis a couple times, he can absolutely get off the tee box like no one's business. Just an all-around athlete. Can't wait for that. So, but you mentioned him staying on the field and potentially helping out the offensive line, which mm -hmm. you're going to have some pieces, some new pieces in there, some shuffling of, of some guys. Uh, an unknown. That's a big question mark. So it's good thing that you have some tight ends that you can call on to help the offensive line. But let's... It's the biggest question mark. Yeah. There, there's no way to go around. It is the biggest question mark on this football team right now. You can look at a lot of different positions. And, you know, the offensive line was really the one position that we didn't go out and get a big name transfer at. Right? I mean, we, we brought in uh, Anthony from Oakland, Splits dude, right? Which was <laughs> impressive, but also <laughs> alarming at the same time. But, you know, I think that you bring in some pieces like that, but you're looking at that offensive line. And now with Nuri's suspension, you're really going, Who? Like, like, that's the biggest question. You lose Cam Jurgens, who goes in the second round. You have Bryce Benhart, who's returning off of a struggling year at right tackle last year. Turner Corcoran, who got moved to right tackle because Teddy came in and then he gets injured. So we really have this small sample size of Teddy, of Teddy Prohaska, right? And he looked really good against Northwestern and he looked decent against Aiden Hutchinson for a quarter and a half. Right? As a so, true freshman. As a true freshman, right? So you have this small sample size, but I think people are going to have to remember he's still a first year player. You're going to have bumps in the road with and him. And coming off an ACL. And coming off an ACL. There's going to be bumps in the road, but that happens with young players. So you look at the left tackle position, you think, okay, Teddy, 
right? Then you bump inside to the left guard position. <laughs> it was supposed to be Nuri, but now who is it? Is it Kevin Williams? Is it Henry Litovsky? Is it Trent Hickson? Is it Turner Corcoran? Trent Hickson is price center. Uh, that's what no one knows. It's this giant unknown, right? So you think, okay, who plays in the left guard spot? Center, probably Hickson, right? But Ethan Piper's still hanging around in there. Turner Corcoran's another guy I think could play center. He's big, he's athletic. The NFL's going to more of those big tackles that have moved into center that can run. You know, so he's a guy, and then you go to right guard, you hope it's Henry Litovsky, who's a absolute mammoth You've been human. praising him. I'm a huge him. Henry fan. Yeah. I'm a huge what Henry What was Litovsky. it? How did you, what did you see in him? Just look at him. Uh -huh. You just look at him, and you're like, yeah, that's an that's a NFL possible, like, guard, right? And the more guys you have of those in the program, the better. And I mean, talking to guys around the, the stadium, they love him, they love his work ethic, they love the things he can do. He has all the possibilities to have a chance. Now he's gotta go prove it, and I'm the one, I'll pound the table for him, because I think he has the great chance to go do it. And he's a guy that needs to step up big, especially with Nuri being gone. Like, he might have to bump to left or wherever he needs to go, but he's young enough that you can kind of plug and play him. Then you go to right tackle, You'd assume it's Ben Hart, right? He's got the most experience, but maybe it's Turner, right? I mean, he, Ben Hart got benched last year for Turner. Turner's coming off the shoulder injury. So, you know, there's another guy that didn't have a spring ball that's going to be coming into that room. And then you don't know about anyone young that maybe had a really good offseason that might be jumping in there too. And, you know, the, the question and the biggest my concern with the O-line room is the depth. There's just not a lot of it. And especially when you lose a guy like Nuri, who is going to be one of your more veteran returners, your depth just is really, really bad. And when you have bad depth, you're one or two injuries away from really struggling in that position. So I wanted to kind of dive into this. Sometimes we don't have time to go into the weeds, but obviously you're, you're the time. expert at this and we have time today. So when you talk about moving guys around and potentially being going from guard to tackle, guard to center, how does that work in terms of what guys can do what position and and how do you go about moving guys around and knowing where they fit best yeah it's really it's a hard thing to do you know i think a lot of times people think like oh he played right tackle just have him go play left or mm -hmm. he played guard he can play tackle right and the thing i always tell people is like next time you go to the bathroom take your off hand and try and wipe yourself it's not as easy as you would think that's a lot of what it's like to switch sides i'm just going to tell you like people listening it's not that easy it's a struggle and you laugh but I, I'm, i've done it i have done i've played all five positions mm -hmm. i've had to do it and it is a big learning curve especially for a young guy that maybe only played one position in high school which is usually left tackle right the best player on the line usually plays left tackle so then they get here and you start moving around it can hamper development a little bit because you don't allow a guy to just stick in one spot and grow because of the depth issues. You might have to swing them around. You really would love to see a guy come in and be like, you're going to be a left tackle. You just practice left tackle until the cows come home. You just practice it, practice it, practice it. It's not always how it goes. Sometimes you got to move guys around. It's like Turner, for example, played left tackle. Then he played right tackle. Now he might be moving inside. Like That's hard on the development of a young player. The good news is they're young. So they're very moldable still. They're not set in horrible habits or anything. And with a new coaching coming in and Coach Donovan, uh, Coach Rayola, you know, there's going to be new techniques. There's going to be new things that he wants to do. So it really is starting from the ground up. So it's not as difficult technique-wise. It can just be really difficult mentally and physically just kind of switch everything in your head and be like, okay, now I'm a guard. I can't take that big first kick. I can't take that big time between there's a lot of space between me and the defender and pass protection right like that three techniques on you like that I mean, he's breathing on if you're a center he's right in your neck right like the timing of everything changes when you're not as uh you switch from center to guard to tackle of how quickly things happen how your footwork has to get shortened up or elongated or just how you work together with a center and a guard versus a tackle and a guard like, there's so many nuances that go into the offensive line of how you work together and how you do things individually that it can be really tough for a young player but you know i think the great ones adapt the great ones adapt and overcome and that's where you really see good players start to emerge family traditions mean great food with treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations, Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition for 65 years. You got a chance to kind of get to know Coach Rayola a little bit in the spring. I know you, you have a perspective on him and, and how he was working with the offensive line, but you, you look in the spring, Nuri practiced in the spring. Mm -hmm. There was no uh, Turner and Teddy wasn't released. So you had a bunch of guys that, you know, um, were playing together that it's probably not what it's going to look like. So 
now that you go into the fall camp, which starts next week, what is Coach Rayola's goal? Because it's not going to be perfect in game one, no. but to get them as close to ready to play in a big game one as possible when you haven't had a chance to work with the guys that are probably going to be on the line come game one. You, you got to try and five. You, you got to try and find your starting five as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And that might be two weeks. That might be two and a half weeks. But you need to go once camp is quote unquote over and you go into more game prep you need to have your starting five ready to go because all those things that I just mentioned, those guys have to learn how to do that with each other. Right. And sometimes it's not the most talented five. You know, it's not always, well, these are my five most talented guys. So we're going to put them out there. It's got to be the right five, the right five that can work together, communicate together. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone knows what we're doing. Maybe there's a young guy, we might put an older guy next to him because he doesn't necessarily have the playbook down as well as someone else. You know, there's all these things that go into it. But I think Coach Rayola's biggest goal is going to be I got to find my five and I got to get them working together really quickly. But I also got to find that second five. You got to have 10. You got to have 10 offensive linemen in college that are game ready at the drop of a hat. Because like I said, injuries happen. Football's the only job in the world that's 100% injury rate, and yet it still plays on Sundays. You know, that you got to have that first group and that second group that are game ready all the time so that if something happens, it's not a steep drop off from starter to second string. And then you throw in a new offense mm -hmm. and going up against guys like Garrett Nelson, Caleb Tanner, and Oshawn Mathis in fall camp every single day. That's not an easy, <laughs> easy not, task. It's not an easy task, you know, but, you know, I had the luxury of going against really good defensive linemen when I played here. Malik Collins, Vincent Valentine, Randy Gregory, I mean, Sue, Crick, all these guys that it made you better. When you're practicing against high-level defensive linemen every single day, it can make the game easier. If you're going up against a guy that's not at the same caliber as someone that you practice against five days a week, then you just, the game slows down a little bit and you can play faster, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're going against a guy that's really talented. Not having the big jump from what practice is to the game really helps. I mean, shoot, I feel like every week last week we're talking about like, this is a first rounder, that's a second rounder, first rounder <laughs> about guys coming off the edge, right? Like that's what the Big Ten is. And so if you can get guys that challenge you every day, on the defensive and offensive line battles, it only makes you better as an individual, it makes you better as a group, and it makes you better as a team. So a few weeks ago on the um, Huskers.com official roster, they changed the names of the defense. It's Edge and Nickel now are on the roster, but then also a lot of people took notice that the weights of the offensive linemen, a lot of them had trimmed down. And so when I sat down with Dave and Zach, they both said that that was the weights that were recorded at the end of spring, that that's not what they're at right now. They have put on a lot of weight, they're big. They're Big Ten linemen. They're looking like Big Ten linemen at the end of summer. So, you know, probably a lot of people read into that and shouldn't have because it's not that was not the accurate weights that what we're going to see going into fall camp. So can you break that down yeah. for us of the difference between what a weight might look like in January at, to going into spring ball at the end of spring ball? And then right now this is the time you gain, right? Yeah. So there's there's a, a year cycle of being a college athlete, any athlete. You, I mean, you know this. You played there's a year cycle that goes into how you train, right? Everyone thinks you just gotta be at peak performance all the time. It's impossible to maintain mm -hmm. that, yeah. right? So we'll just start, let's just call it January, right? Say you, we play in a bowl game this year. So we're, we're gonna say this is 2023. We play in a bowl game December 31st, right? You get into January and your body is trashed. You just played an entire season. You're probably weights down, your muscle mass is down. You're just trying to get to Saturday and stay healthy and you have to lift during the season, but you can't push it like you normally can. January, you go into winter conditioning, which is a big time of just starting to get your muscle mass back and getting your body back into the ability to make gains. You don't just make gains, you have to prep your body. And that's what January and February are really about is prepping your body to get into that weight gain mode. So then you get in the kind of the late part of February, you got to start sprinkling some conditioning in there now and some weightlifting to get ready for spring ball because you do have to get your body calloused up to go to war every single day because that's what spring ball is. Spring ball is war. So you go in there and then during spring you have to start conditioning. And so spring ball is a conditioning in itself because any athlete that you've ever talked to that's done spring football will tell you it's the worst time of year imaginable. You're not prepping for a game. You're not getting ready for a season. It is just war constantly. So during spring and that you're lifting heavy, you're practicing heavy, you're running, like you're maxing your body out to its limits. But again, you're growing that body preparedness to go into summer. Mm -hmm. So through the spring, you get beat down. You trim up, you lose fat. 
you do all those things, you don't necessarily gain muscle, but you do trim down just because of the work capacity and the load that you're doing. Get done with spring ball, now the fun begins. Now the work of the preparation for fall camp and season begins. And that's really your April, May, June, July time of now it's hardcore in the weight room because your body's ready for that again. Hardcore in the weight room, hardcore on the field, and you're just growing you're growing your physical preparedness to grow that kind of curve where you want to get yourself to your climbing like this so you're not reaching peak performance in late June. Right. right? It's a gradual incline so that you're reaching your peak performance about the middle of fall camp. Right? You, you lift heavy, lift heavy, condition, condition, you hit fall camp, and then you find this kind of middle ground of what football shape is, and then you try and just hold on to that as long as you can during the season. And it's just a gradual decline. But all the work you did during the summertime is how you help slow that decline as the season goes on. You can't just get to mid-October and just fall off the cliff. Right. right? You have to kind of slowly decline and try and stay at the, the plateau as long as possible so that you can still continue to prepare on the field. And then once you get to January, you start it all over again. And that's just kind of the cycle of which it is to be a football player, to be an athlete in any sport. But football is really one just because you take such a beating on the body. Yeah, and they'll release the updated weights. They were going to do all of the uh, scans and everything mm -hmm. this week before they go into fall camp. So they'll know exactly yep. where they're at. But they said absolutely. It's They put on the weight. They look good. They're excited about the progress. Mm -hmm that the O-line made in, in that regard. But yeah, don't get too freaked out that they've lost weight. They just did a lot more extra conditioning there at the end of the spring. Just Bigger, with faster, the, stronger. Yeah, the field and then the, you know, week one in Dublin, they, they kind of took a different approach and, and they really pushed hard on the conditioning and they hit the weight room hard here this fall. We're gonna, you know, dive into Northwestern and previewing in our next podcast mm -hmm. that we drop. But, you know, again, we're taping this before the start of fall camp. You just broke down how intrigued, intrigued you are about the offensive line. That's the biggest question. So outside of the offensive line, before we get into fall camp, what position group are you, do you have circled that you're the most excited about other than the offensive line uh, shocker, to watch? Shocker here, I'm sure, but the defensive line. Oh. You know, you, you look at and we talk a lot about the offensive line, but we lost a lot off that defensive line last year. You talk about Ben Stilley, you talk about Daniels. I mean, Thomas, you, you just talk about all the guys that were contributors last year and big time are now gone. I mean, you talk, you have Ty Robinson and Nash that played meaningful snaps last year. I mean, meaningful in big games at big moments. Everyone else kind of mop up duty or they got one or two snaps here or there. And so you got to see some young guys in the spring, uh, guys like Feast. You know, I think he's a guy, a name that I hear a lot around here that's going to do well. But really, who's going to emerge as the rotational guys because D linemen they do rotate much more than offensive linemen do you know you need to have five or six guys that you can throw in there at any point in the game and get production out of you know so that's a that's a group that I'm going to continue to look at and I'm talking more interior I'm not talking about yeah. Garrett Nelson and Caleb Tanner I'm talking more interior defensive line because you got to have guys that can hold up against the Michigans and the Wisconsin's and the Iowa's when you're mid-November and it's crappy weather outside and you're going to get power ran at you 40 times can you stop it with your D linemen can you keep the offensive line from getting to those linebackers so that Reimer and those guys can have clear tackling lanes you know that's the position group for me other than the offensive line that has the most question marks in it right now well and then you add the two guys that weren't here in the spring from the portal that you got to figure out how they rotate in and I, mm -hmm. I told Greg this the other night on Sports Nightly I'm not as concerned about who's going to start on the defensive nope. line it's can you build a rotation of where you have that line change and you're keeping those guys fresh like we saw oh you're gonna kill year. the sideline look at you you're just you're talking about the <laughs> line rotation oh yeah you're gonna have no issue down there on the sideline well you know I just it's more about you know because you said it how as an offensive lineman, you're out there every single snap, but it is daunting when you got fresh legs coming out there. On third and eight, yeah. yeah. It's not a fun time to be 14th play on a drive and it's third and eight on the fringe red zone and you see four fresh bodies come trotting out <laughs> onto the field. Yeah, it's not a great feeling. So when you were on the sideline for the spring game, you, you talked to JoJo and mm -hmm. he was talking about Eric Chenander. You asked the question, what was it about that defense that made it so special? And he talked about how Coach Chenander tailored that defense to its strengths. So he changed some things around. He moved JoJo to the nickel and kind of built it around where his strengths were of that defense. So if you're 
Coach Janander right now, what would you say, how is he building this defense for this year? You know, I think right now he has a lot of plans going to fall camp. And that's the great thing about fall camp is it's kind of experiment time. Mm -hmm. You know, what works, what doesn't work. You install everything, right? You install everything from base defense to nickel to your blitz packages. And you throw it all out there. And then as fall camp goes on, you throw stuff out that doesn't look good. And you add things that do look good. And then you really come down to your core. You know, I think that when you look at this, you think, okay, I've got talented edge guys so let's try and find ways to get those guys as many one-on-one opportunities with tackles as possible and say hey go win but at the same time he's a phenomenal blitzer uh, blitz package I should say Eric Shenander puts phenomenal blitz packages together and he needs to find the next Jojo that he can send off the edge in those things where he schemes up a blitz where the protections turn the wrong way so he knows this is a free hitter and Jojo had that closing speed to go in there and make a big play he needs to find that next guy because that's a big piece of Chenander's defense is his blitz packaging. So, you know, how he does that, how he allows those edge guys to go. But a big time, too, is he doesn't want to blitz if he doesn't have full trust in his back end. You know, you got if you send someone, you have to have full trust in your back end that they're going to hold up because there's going to be less guys back there to defend. Right. And so you have Quentin Newsom, you have Tommy Hill, you have Braxton Clark, you have a couple new guys in the back end. So the trust that they can build through fall camp will allow Chenander to be as aggressive as he wants to be going into week one. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk again in the middle of fall camp, but as you go into the first week of fall camp, what's the goal of this football team? The goal of this football team is just to start laying the groundwork for what this season is going to be. Discipline, making sure there's no pre-snap penalties, making sure you're not John at someone and getting a 15 yard penalty, right? Just starting to put good habits together early on because when you grow good habits from the word go, those habits just become second nature. Now they're not things you're worried about anymore. They're just the standard. But this football team has had issues with that in the past. They've had issues with discipline of pre-snap penalties. They've had issues with doing something dumb at a critical point in the game that's cost us games. Coach Frost has talked about it numerous times. Growing those habits during the beginning part of fall camp are going to be really important. So again, circling all the way back, it trickles down to the young guys that they see this is the way. This is just the way it's done here. It's not, oh, we jumped off sides, better go run again. No, we don't jump off sides. We just don't do it. That's just not an acceptable thing to do here. We don't get 15-yard penalties. We don't do DPIs. We don't pull on a guy because we're beat. We beat him with our feet and we get back in football position, right? You know, those are the type of things that as good football teams, they don't think about it. They don't talk about it. They just do it. And we need to get to that point for here. And it starts when the first practice starts here in a week. Do you think we'll know more about maybe certain positions being set quicker than we might we might hear otherwise in other seasons because of the week one? So, for example, quarterback, um, you know, that's an open competition. While Casey emerged as a leader, that's an open competition going into fall camp. Some of those, you know, spots in the offensive line you said and, and the secondary, will those spots be more solidified earlier? potentially than we normally see because of this week one matchup when we say we do we mean you and i (laughs) or do we mean the building behind me because they'll know we will not yeah we will not you know i think that coach frost plays things very close to the vest Mm -hmm. you know when you go into a week zero matchup you want to make sure you don't give anything to the other team right we saw it against illinois last year they came out in a whole new defense something we didn't really prepare for right you know so we won't know no the answer to that question is as a public we're going to get the same old you'll see when they go out there or Mm -hmm. all of that you know and that's fine but i do think that this staff and these teammates and this team will know quicker than previous years all right before uh, we let you get out of here gotta ask you about austin allen Mm. um cool to see him go to the giants how's how have things been going for him? Phenomenal. You know, I think we were all surprised, myself, him, and a lot of guys I talked to that he didn't get drafted. Um, it was a very weird year for tight ends. There was a lot of them, but there was a lot of them in, like, the later rounds. There was Trey McBride, and then there really wasn't anyone else in, like, that top tier of tight end. So you had this big group of tight ends kind of lumped there at the end, and Austin was so specific, he got really close to being drafted. And I do mean really close. We had a lot of teams that were going to pick him and go there, and one-way thing didn't go his way. But we were able as an agency to really find a great spot for him in the Giants. You know, they drafted Bellinger out of South Dakota State, who's going to probably be their why. But talking with Austin and talking, he was getting reps with ones and the twos. And, wow. you know, as an undrafted free agent, that's a hard thing to do. And right. so I think he's laid a really good groundwork for himself during OTAs and veteran minicamp and going into fall camp. I know they're really excited for what he can do up there. And I have a lot of confidence that Austin Allen's going to make that 53 and make the 46 and be playing come week zero. Wow, that's awesome. So what does he need to do to, to solidify you know, that? When you do 
do it during training camp, it's great. But when during, excuse me, when you do it during OTAs, that's great. But when the big boy pads come on in the NFL, it is a whole different world. I mean, it is a completely different world from OTAs. And that's where you really see the boys separated from the men. And I think that if Austin go out there and really show that he can block, you know, that's a big thing. As a tight end in the NFL, you have to be able to hold up. I'm not saying you have to go dominate those edge guys, but you've got to be able to hold up in pass protection in the run game or whatever it may be, cracking back. Like, you just got to show toughness. And Austin is tough as they come, you know. So I think if he can really solidify his blocking ability, he has some really natural hands, which we saw here, and he's such a big mismatch for there. Yeah, like, he's a tough the pass game, he runs great routes. It's going to be a lot about his run blocking and how well he does at the line of scrimmage that's going to really make the difference from him being a contributor this year or maybe more of a role player. What has he thought of New York, the Nebraska <laughs> kid? I think it's a little bit much. Not much. I think it was a little eye-opening um, uh -huh. for him but you know I think that he has a good group of teammates out there I know that he went down uh, Daniel Jones had a lot of the guys come down to somewhere I don't remember where they went and they all got together this offseason and ran routes and just so I think he's got a really good core group of guys out there that he feels comfortable with and uh, I think he likes it up there a lot and I know coach Dable coach Dable the head coach up there was my offensive coordinator in Buffalo so I know him real well so chatting with Dable a little bit they love Austin up there too how ready are you this is your first time you got guys that... uh, I can't wait I'm, I'm are you I've nervous been, I am I'm so <laughs> nervous you know and like I've told all my guys like listen I'm going to be blowing your phone up. Like, I'm going to want to know how things are going. Like, you can tell me to go pound sand and I'll say sure. But, like, I'm so anxious for these young guys to get there because they put in so much work from January of last year up into this point that now it's really time to, boy, just cut it loose and go. You know, I have three O-linemen that we started an O-line facility up in Minneapolis with uh, Alex Boone, who's a 10-year NFL vet, that we're training just offensive linemen. We put on a camp for college offensive linemen that I'm hoping to get some Nebraska kids up to next year. Um, so our offensive linemen are there. We have tight end in Austin. You know, these guys are kind of, it's like, it's like sending your kids from the nest for the first time, you know, to go to, go to big boy school. So I'm really excited for them. I feel like we have them all really well prepared, but now it's time to go, go make your money. But will you have to, I mean, hopefully all your guys make. Hopefully I don't have to do anything. I know, but hopefully <laughs> your guys all make their teams. Yes. But if not, will you be looking out and seeing oh, yeah. where they fit next? Yeah, like, I so mean, it's still not like your job's not. Oh yeah, my job is not done. You yeah. know, I, I think right now it's a little bit of a holding pattern because you got to kind of see where the chips fall. Um, but I mean, there's 90 guys on every roster right now and come August uh, 28th, I believe it is, uh, or August 31st is going to be cut down to 53. And there's gonna be a lot of guys that are sitting on the street. There's gonna be a lot of guys that are, their dreams are over. Um, and there's a lot of guys that are going to be bouncing practice squads and active and inactive. And so, yeah, my job is far from over. But right now, it's kind of just this holding pattern and see what happens. You don't have anybody with the Cardinals, right? They're I hard don't. knocks, right? Yes. I'm very glad. Always, I'm glad I don't because that's just an absolute nightmare I situation. know, but they always usually kind of follow a lot of those guys that are trying to make the roster. Have you ever watched those cut episodes? Those are the saddest things know, imaginable. It really is. Like, it's, it's the worst. It's literally, you watch the dream get shattered. And, like, I've sat in that room. I've been cut before. It's terrible. The worst thing in the world I can imagine is some camera being like all right hold it hold <laughs> hold that emotion be like dude get out of my face like yeah it's the, i don't watch the cut episodes because it just makes me so sad but it's also cool though to see the guys that do yes make the team yes so that's where it's, it's that's where it's fun and that's where it's cool but the the really sad side of the nfl is really sad yeah absolutely all right well on that note what a great ending though but <laughs> no none of my guys are going to be sad no absolutely not but no we'll be back again again we'll be dropping this every week like we did last yep. year, same thing. You can expect us to, to have previews and breakdowns and all of that, but we'll be back again mid-fall camp back after we know a little bit more of, of how things are going uh, in fall camp. But wanted to get one at least rolling in July um, before, you know, to catch up, but before we got things rolling and, and all of that. So we'll look forward to having you back here in about a month or so. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to be back. And again, sad I'm not going to be around on game day, but you ain't getting rid of me that easy. No, you'll still hear your voice. We'll, absolutely. We'll, we're still uh, bringing the sideline slice perspective this year, thanks to Valentina's with Jeremiah Searles. All right, that will put a bow on this edition of the sideline slice. Again, thanks to Valentino's, the official pizza of the Huskers. And uh, we'll be back with you here in about a month to talk all things Huskers fall camp. Go Big Red.